All right, so today we're going to talk about the digestive system. Uh, this is going to be the first system of the last group of systems that we're going to cover. Um, and once we get through reproductive, we will actually have covered all the systems in the body. Today we're going to look at the anatomy and physiology of all of the organs of the system. And then we're going to go through the processes and functions of the whole system, um, organ by organ, and talk a little bit about um, the metabolic consequences of the system as well. So we'll start with a nice overview of the anatomy and the functions, and then we're going to go from the mouth all the way through following the same path that food takes. So the digestive system, when you look at it in a broad sense, has just some very basic functions. It breaks down the foods that we consume and um, ultimately uh, allows us to absorb the nutrients from those foods um, into the body so that we can use them. The digestive system is composed of two basic parts. So the gastrointestinal tract is a continuous tube from your mouth all the way through to your anus. It doesn't work alone though. The accessory organs are the other components of the digestive system that contribute to the functions of the gastrointestinal tract but are not actually part of the tube. So when we look at the details of that, we can see that the tube itself has different names based on where it is and what it does. Uh, and so this is all the parts of the tube. And then the accessory organs um, are actually kind of just divided up into two groups. So we have a set of them associated with the mouth, which are the teeth, the tongue, and the salivary glands. And then we also have a set associated with um, oops, pen color here, um, associated with the small intestine and enzymatic digestion of nutrients. And so those are those guys right there. So we'll touch on the accessory organs as we get to the parts of the gastrointestinal tract that they support. But when we take all of these organs together, they make up the digestive system. Now, the gastrointestinal tract has a fairly consistent structure throughout the entire tube, although there are some minor um, minor differences in specific locations. But ultimately, um, the whole thing is made up of four tissue layers, and then the, uh, the differences are just modifications that allow, um, that allow the parts of the tube, so the specific organs, to meet their functional criteria. So the four layers that we see um, are the serosa. Now the serosa is actually only present for organs in the abdominal cavity, but we'll cover that in a little bit. Um, then, so that's the outermost layer. Underneath that is a muscular layer. So we call it the muscularis. It's usually two different layers of smooth muscle running in different directions longitudinally along the length of the tube, and then um, a circular layer running around the tube. Uh, then we have a submucosa of supporting connective tissue, and then the mucosa um, is where the epithelial tissue that interacts with the lumen is located. So it kind of looks like this. Um, all of our hollow tubular organs have a similar structure, so this should look somewhat similar to blood vessels, but obviously also very different. So serosa on the outside, muscular layer, submucosa, mucosa. And we call it the mucosa because the, um, the, the, the openings to the gastrointestinal tract are exposed to the external environment. And so the mucous membranes are the mucosa of this, um, well, let me say it a different way. Uh, the mucosa of this system is included in the mucous membranes that protect all of our entryways. So um, there's actually several layers to the mucosa. So there's the epithelium, 
which is of course in contact with the surface because that's what epitheliums do. Uh, and it in, um, although the specific cell types do vary, there are typically mucus producing cells, so goblet cells, and then um, enteroendocrine cells, which secrete hormones that are specific to the digestive system. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so then the epithelium is supported by a lamina propria. All epithelia are supported by a connective tissue layer. So the lamina propria or proper layer um, is just some loose connective tissue that connects the epithelium to the underlying tissues, um, helps form the basement membrane between them, um, and allows for blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and lymphatic tissue to run um, through to the epithelium. And then the mucosa also typically has a fairly thin layer of smooth muscle itself. And this um, helps keep the surface of the tube uh, folded up. So it's not like it's not like you just have like a pipe and a straight running tube. There, there is texture to that surface. And we'll talk about it as we get to each uh, part. Um, but generally speaking, the goal of that is to increase the surface area for digestion and absorption. So deep to the mucosa is the submucosa, literally just named under the mucosa, because that's what sub means is under. And this is a dense connective tissue layer. So this is the like sturdy protective connective tissue layer connecting the mucosa to the muscularis layer, which is um, on the other side. So this provides a pathway for the larger blood vessels and lymphatic vessels um, that supply the mucosa. And it also has a complex network of nerves and ganglia called the submucosal plexus, which is a major component of the enteric nervous system, which is a whole separate part of the autonomic nervous system than what we've discussed before. So we briefly mentioned it um, previously, but this is the system where we actually discuss it because this is the system that it regulates. So the submucosal plexus regulates um, our digestive reactions to food. So basically the way the digestive system modifies its behaviors um, when you eat and digestive secretions because all of the glands that secrete stuff in to help with digestion are located either in the mucosa or the submucosa. So the third layer is the muscularis and as I said it's typically two layers, so there's usually an inner circular layer and then an outer longitudinal layer. Um, the stomach is special in that it has an additional oblique layer. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, there are some other exceptions. So at the beginning of the tract, we actually have skeletal muscle. We will touch on that. And then at the very end as well. Um, so those are some exceptions or differences. And the reason why we have these layers is to both mix the contents of the, of the di uh, gastrointestinal tract as well as transport them along so that they move all the way through. There's a whole separate myenteric plexus here, so a whole separate portion of the enteric nervous system, although they are connected to each other. And this one is in charge of regulating the smooth muscle. So we regulate both the rhythm of contraction and the force of contraction and um, the plexus coordinates these complex smooth muscle actions for the mixing and the transporting. So again, the outermost layer is called the serosa in the organs within the abdominal cavity. Um, and the serosa is the connection between um, the organs themselves and the mesentery, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, but um, it's basically um, all a component of the peritoneal membrane, which is to the digestive system what the pleural membrane is to the lungs and what the pericardial membrane is to the heart, okay? And so just like the visceral layer of those membranes cover the outside of those organs, so too, in the abdominal cavity, we have a visceral peritoneum over some loose connective tissue, 
forming the outermost layer of these organs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a bit as well, because this one's a little more complicated. So for the organs that aren't in the abdominal cavity, so like your mouth, your pharynx, your esophagus, um, they're outside of that, uh, they don't have serosa. Instead, they just have basically dense irregular connective tissue that we call adventitia that just anchors these things to their surroundings. Um, you know, it's weird to think about your mouth as having like a discrete covering, but technically it does. Um, your esophagus has to run down your neck, through your thorax, and then finally emerge into your abdomen. And so it's got these, these nice connective tissue te sheaths that keep it um, anchored in place. So here's that again, um, the anatomy of the whole thing. And so the mesentery is basically the extension of the visceral peritoneum. So it's wrapped around the outside of the tube and then extends up. Um, the enteric nervous system is definitely the largest amount of neurons that we have outside of the central nervous system. So there's about 100 million neurons in your guts. And um, they're semi-autonomic. And by that, we mean that they do a lot of stuff on their own without outside input, but they are connected to the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches, and therefore to the central nervous system as well. And so there are interactions with and influences by um, your, your brain and, and your spinal cord and stuff like that. Um, it's super interesting and it's stuff we're still sorting out. Um, if you're curious about that, you can check out some resources, but that's as far as we have time to go into because we don't even have time for the other stuff. Okay, so the peritoneum, it's our third serous membrane, all right? This one lines the abdominal cavity, whereas the other two are within the thoracic cavity. Serous again just means that there's a simple squamous epithelium with a thin layer of supporting connective tissue. Um, that epithelium is gonna secrete serous fluid. And um, again, and I don't know how well I explained this last time around, but this is about reducing friction. So, you know, we have this nice, very smooth surface to the outside of these organs. The inside of the abdominal cavity is lined by the parietal peritoneum, and we have this peritoneal cavity in between. And there's not really a lot of space there. There's just this small amount of fluid and everything is actually packed in, you know, so back to that whole idea of like a plastic bag with a little bit of water in between the layers and you can move them back and forth, but it's hard to peel them apart. That's really more what it's like. It's not like it's a vast empty space when we say a cavity. Um, but nevertheless, uh, all of these organs are moving as they carry out their functions and we want them to be able to move without any resistance. And so the, the serous membrane and the serous fluid allow for a frictionless um, movement. Well, if we take a cross section, it kind of looks like this. So um, these double blue lines are the membranes. So the, I need to pick a different color. Of course I have the one color that's like the same. So the parietal is up against basically the inside of the abdominal muscles. And then <clears throat> up here, uh, this is the posterior aspect. So like the, the, the deep part of your abdominal cavity, it gives off these, these stalks. And those stalks come out and wrap around all these organs as the visceral peritoneum. So we can look at it from this sagittal view as well, uh, where, oh, that's not actually it, sorry. Um, where this is the parietal, and then um, we're coming off as little stalks to wrap around all of these organs. See that? 
So it's much more complex because we have so many different organs in there. Whereas with our other ones, we had a single organ within a serous membrane. So the, the stalk that connects between the parietal peritoneum and the visceral peritoneum is called the mesentery. And since it kind of comes out doubling up from either side of parietal, it's a double layer of peritoneum and it just kind of wraps itself around these intestines. And the nice thing is that that provides a pathway for all the vessels and lymph nodes that are supplying these organs. Um, it also tends to store fat. Uh, it's, a, it's an adipose storage area, which uh, you know not only is energy storage, but also helps with adipose's role in like um, both insulating and kind of uh, providing padding around delicate organs, so protection. Uh, the mesentery part of it um, is actually spread between all these intestines, so um, they're quite connected to each other because all of this is mesentery, connecting up these loops of, um, of bowel. And then there are actually additional folds that don't actually hold organs. So there's uh, folds that are not visceral per se because they're not around any organs, but they're protruding out and so they're not even really parietal. So we call them um, omenta. There's a greater omentum and a lesser omentum. And the greater omentum is basically an apron covering your intestines. So it starts at your stomach and just kind of hangs out and it's like a doubled double fold, which is super weird. Um, we do a lot of fat storage in that one. And then your lesser omentum is much smaller. It's between your stomach and your liver, so it kind of sits up here. And it's not nearly as exciting. Okay, so we've got those as well. And actually you can see the greater omentum is right here. And then um, finally, there are things in the abdomen that aren't inside of the peritoneal cavity. So uh, there are lots of things that are up against the posterior body wall and the parietal peritoneum actually covers the front of them, their anterior aspect. So we say that these things are retroperitoneal. They're in the abdomen, but not in the peritoneal cavity. And so our kidneys, ureters, adrenal glands are all there. So pretty much our entire urinary system is actually retroperitoneal. Um, our adrenal glands are right by the kidney, so they are too. The abdominal aorta, so the aorta, that first blood vessel or artery of the systemic circulation comes down the back um, of your abdomen. So it sits outside of the peritoneal cavity, as does the inferior vena cava, which is the final vein delivering blood back to the heart from your um, inferior half. So the anterior surface of these is covered in parietal peritoneum, and then they sit behind that and they have their own outer layers. Uh, we do have little parts of the digestive system that are retroperitoneal as well. So the duodenum and the pancreas and a few parts of the colon are also retroperitoneal. So uh, retroperitone yeah, retroperitoneal stuff works like this. So this red line that we can see is the parietal peritoneum. We're just getting a little bit of mesentery and visceral peritoneum around a little bit of intestine. And everything that is back here is retroperitoneal. So this is showing us the aorta and the vena cava, as well as parts of the colon. And I'll, um, we'll look at a little bit more of it as we get to specific ones, okay? So that's kind of our uh, basic anatomy. When we look at our basic uh, physiology, um, we find that there are six digestive activities that are carried out. And some of them are carried out throughout pretty much the entire tract. And some of them really only occur in a specific location.
So um, ingestion only happens in your mouth. So we'll talk about it there. And uh, defecation only happens at the anus. So we will talk about it there. Um, but everything else pretty much occurs to some extent everywhere. And so we just wanna briefly go through what those are. Um, so propulsion is one of the major jobs of the muscularis layer. So the smooth muscles um, are able to transport the luminal contents from the mouth to the anus. So peristalsis, which I briefly did tell you about before, is the primary transportation or propulsion method of the gastrointestinal tract. So the lymphatic vessels do this too, that's where you've heard it before, um, but this is definitely the most important in the digestive system. And basically what happens is that you have this tube and you have something in it that you wanna move. So you contract down behind it and relax in front of it and that squeezes it forward. And then you do this over and over and over again and it keeps moving forward. So there it goes. A little gift that I managed to find a little while ago showing you essentially how this works. So this is one of those things that that myenteric plexus is gonna coordinate And um, we see it pretty much throughout the whole tract. Wherever there's smooth muscle, we're gonna have peristalsis. Um, when it comes to digestion, we do split it up between mechanical digestion, which is the physical breakdown of food into smaller particles. Um, we start that process with mastication or chewing. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then we'll kind of cover the basic types of mechanical digestion as we go through. Um, Mechanical digestion does not change the chemical makeup of the molecules. Whereas chemical digestion, we're actually breaking chemical bonds to make the molecules themselves smaller. So um, you kind of have to do the mechanical digestion first for the most part, and then the chemical digestion is more effective after the mechanical digestion takes place. Um, so mechanical digestion is mostly done with muscular action. Chemical digestion requires water to dissolve um, the molecules into solution. We need enzymes to break the chemical bonds. And as we'll talk about, we use acids and salts as well to get this process to occur. Uh, one of the major um, smooth muscle actions that we see for mechanical digestion is called segmentation. Segmentation is a mixing process. It's kind of like everybody tried to do peristalsis at the same time, and so instead of anything moving forward, everything just sloshes back and forth. So you're just kind of like contracting and relaxing, alternating segments, and it mixes everything together better. So like I said, we're gonna cover everything else in more detail when we get there. Um, although absorption does happen in a lot of places, most of it happens in the small intestine. So we'll hit that there as well. Um, so this is our, our summary of the functions. And uh, we're gonna start with what happens in the mouth. So when we talk about the mouth, um, the technical term is the oral cavity that encompasses everything in and around the mouth. Um, it's the only part of the gastrointestinal tract involved in ingestion, right? We only have one entryway into this system. So um, uh, ingestion is just bringing food into the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, now the oral cavity does other things and mostly that's as a result of its accessory organs. So teeth are responsible for the mechanical digestion of chewing or mastication. Um, saliva released by the salivary glands lubricates food and does other things we'll touch on in a second. Um, and then the other thing that the mouth does is propulsion um, in that we can swallow our food to move it farther down the tract. And we'll talk about that um, in a little bit more detail. So oral cavity, since we've covered respiratory already, you know that the nasal cavity is up here 
and you've heard of the pharynx because we learned about it already. So now we don't care about the nasopharynx. We're just looking at the oral cavity and everything below that. Um, and so basically from the lips and the cheeks inwards um, back to about here, including the tongue um, and the jaw bones and stuff, all of that's gonna be your oral cavity. Um, saliva is of course a pretty important component of what happens here. So um, we have a bunch of salivary glands, including three pairs of big ones, and then pretty much all of your mucosa in there has some small salivary glands too. And everything that we secrete is basically either watery saliva or mucus. There's always going to be mucus the whole, the whole way through. Um, saliva has a variety of functions. So in between meals, it helps to cleanse our mouth. Obviously not perfect, so brush your teeth. Um, it, uh, the watery portion dissolves food molecules so that we can taste them with gustation. It also moistens our food and helps compact it into a bolus, which is basically just like a, a little oval of food, which is what we need food to be shaped into in order to swallow it. And then we have an enzyme in the saliva called amylase that starts digesting starch. So um, saliva does a ton of stuff, very important. It's quite difficult to eat without it. You would have to um, have very wet food or drink a lot of water in small sips. So here's kind of your big ones. We've got these guys back here. Um, and then the other two are basically under your jaw. You don't really need to know the details though. Um, our teeth are also accessory organs. And so we have a couple different types that do different things. So our incisors are the flat teeth up front and they are the ones that are going to cut your food into smaller pieces for ingestion. So those are incisors. So basically the first four teeth in both jaws your canines are supposed to be fairly pointy and they tear our food. Um, ours are not impressive, but if you have a dog or a cat or you've seen any predatory animal open its mouth, you've seen some good canines. Um, we don't need them as much because, you know, we have knives and um, other utensils that do a lot of that for us. Uh, the premolars uh, crush the food. So... Oh, I totally drew on the canine there. Sorry, that's a canine. And, um, sorry, the premolars crush the food and then the molars grind the food. So these guys are masticating the food or starting um, physical digestion. Uh, technically, we're, we have three sets of molars, but um, the third one is the wisdom teeth and they are usually taken out because we don't really have room for them anymore. So that's teeth. Now, all of our teeth have a basic um, anatomical features. So we've learned about the joints that hold them in, right? We have gomphoses, which are fibrous joints that attach the root of the tooth to the alveolus, the, the socket in the bone. And there are other parts of the tooth as well. So the crown is everything that sticks out above the gums, which are also called the gingiva. The neck is the part that's under the gums where there's still enamel, that shiny white hard stuff that we grind with. And then the root is everything within the bony socket that's attached with these teeny tiny little collagen ligaments. Um, and then internally, we have this pulp cavity. And so the pulp cavity is the part of the tooth that's actually like alive alive so the rest of it's kind of just more like um uh you know bone tissue like it's alive but it's not um it's very very hard there it, the your your tooth substances are harder than bone we're not going to worry about the details of that but anyway um so blood vessels and nerves run from the tips of the roots in through this pulp cavity and so that's why your teeth um have you know sensation and stuff 
and if you get like a cavity or something where there's entryway into that pulp cavity then it's going to hurt a lot and then you might have to have a root canal where they drill out all this living stuff and then they just like cap it all with dead stuff and then you technically have a dead tooth that's okay they still work so um the mouth functions in a nutshell are basically just we chew up the food and mix it with saliva okay and then we swallow but in order to understand swallowing we need to cover the next two parts which are the pharynx and the esophagus and technically the larynx is in there but the larynx is actually part of the respiratory system so i just mostly have to point out the epiglottis to you uh, the fancy name for swallowing is deglutition. So once we look at the anatomy of the pharynx and the esophagus, we'll go through that process. So remember that the pharynx is that short little muscular funnel that connects both the oral and nasal cavities with the openings to the trachea and the gastrointestinal tract. Now the esophagus is a muscular tube that's collapsed when it's not moving food. It has a muscular sphincter on either end and it connects the pharynx and the oral cavity to the stomach, right? So it moves food from your head to your abdomen. So oral cavity is here. Oh my God, I don't know if you guys can hear this, but there is the worst construction noise. Um, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, here's your larynx down here. The part we care about is the, glot, uh, the epiglottis because that's going to cover the opening to the, the trachea so that when we swallow, it goes down the esophagus. So your esophagus sits posterior to or just behind your trachea. Remember I showed you that before. And the um, esophagus has sphincters to regulate movement through. So there's an upper esophageal sphincter which keeps your esophagus closed most of the time and that prevents you from like accidentally swallowing a bunch of air all the time which would be just awful because the majority of the time right we're not using our esophagus we're using our trachea um, so your upper esophageal sphincter is basically just a thickening of the muscle right at the beginning um, peristalsis moves everything down and then there's a lower esophageal sphincter that's marking the opening into the stomach. Um, it has this, the standard layers. Uh, the only difference with the esophagus is that um, at the beginning of the esophagus, just like the mouth and the pharynx, uh, we have skeletal muscle instead of smooth muscle. And this is relevant because it contributes to our ability to vomit effectively which I know isn't very fun, but it's potentially very useful because it's meant to get things out of our system that could make us sick. So it's a good thing that we can vomit, even though it's never fun to actually do. So deglutition involves the mouth, the pharynx, and the esophagus. It's a super complicated process because you have to coordinate um, a bunch of different muscles and some of them are skeletal and some of them are smooth and it starts with voluntary skeletal muscle action so the buckle or voluntary phase buckle just refers to the mouth um, is when you start swallowing so you're chewing right and you're getting ready to actually swallow so you use your tongue to push whatever's in your mouth so we call it the bolus again to the back of the oral cavity. This is the part you have control over. Once you get it into the back of the mouth, we switch over to involuntary uh, processes. So the pharyngeal phase is when we switch over to involuntary stuff. And so your soft palate moves up to close off the back of your nasopharynx, which prevents food from moving into your nasal cavity from your oropharynx. The epiglottis closes off the trachea so that you're not, you know, accidentally inhaling things that are food. So now you've created a pathway from the oral pharynx into the esophagus. And the um, pharyngeal muscles are all going to squeeze to make it all move in there. Um, 
we get it into the esophagus by uh, relaxing that sphincter. The food moves through that sphincter, and then it's all peristalsis all the way down. And the peristalsis is good enough that we can swallow when we're upside down and still get stuff into our stomachs. I don't think it's any fun, but you can do it. So we're not gravity dependent for getting things into our stomachs. This is just the same thing, but in picture form. So once we move this into the back of our throat, we're relying on involuntary actions, so reflexive actions to get it the rest of the way in. And that's why when, you know, something happens at that point in time, you can like accidentally kind of choke and stuff because you're overriding an involuntary action when there's something in the back of your throat. This is never very fun. All right, so the esophagus, peristalsis into the stomach, and that takes us into the abdomen. So now we're going to look at the stomach and its anatomy and its physiology. So the stomach is um, super important, uh, although not critical. You don't technically need one, but it's very useful because um, it's very expansive. So it's able to temporarily store a meal. It can, this is I believe an average, but it can actually hold up to four liters of ingesta. So like a gallon of stuff in your stomach. And that allows us to eat significantly sized meals and then slowly digest them over time. If we didn't have a stomach, then we would have to just kind of constantly be eating small amounts because we'd have no storage ability for food. Uh, the stomach is going to continue mechanical digestion of food. That's one of the reasons why it has three layers of smooth muscle. It's also the location of the beginning of protein digestion which I'll touch on in a second. And um, it mixes the food together with gastric juice, which is everything that is secreted by the stomach lining. Um, when it mixes up that food with the gastric juice, it forms something called chyme. All right, so let's see how that all works. First, the anatomy. Uh, there's four regions to the stomach. The very first part is called the cardia and it's where the lower esophageal sphincter is located. It's the entryway into the stomach. Very small region, it's pretty much just the sphincter. Uh, there is a fundus to the stomach, which is a superior little dome. So basically your esophagus comes in over here, and then your fundus sits above it. The majority of the stomach is the body, and it's below the cardia. And then your stomach kind of funnels down, which we call the pylorus. It's the last part. There is a sphincter here as well, the pyloric sphincter. And so that's the part where we then transition to the small intestine. Um, so we're, we have to control that exit as well. So entryway and exit and everything in between. Uh, so third layer of muscle is, is the other unique feature here. Um, when the stomach isn't fully distended or full, uh, there is a texture to the mucosa, basically all folds up, um, and we call those folds rugae. And then uh, you saw my little doodle that the stomach has a shape to it. So uh, there's less distance between the cardia and the pylorus on the top, so we call that the lesser curvature, and there's more distance from, um, from them, between them on the inferior part, so we call that the greater curvature. So it looks like this, and the rugae are these little foldy guys. Basically, because it can stretch, it has extra mucosa when it's not stretched. As far as um, the histology of these things, we usually just worry about the epithelium. So the stomach um, is lined with uh, um, mucus producing cells. The mucus protects uh, the, the epithelium from the acid that is secreted into it. Uh, in order to actually have secretory cells of other things, then they're, they're hidden in what are called gastric pits. 
So there's basically little hole openings on the surface of the epithelium, and then the rest of the cells are buried in these gastric glands, and they produce all of the components of the gastric juice. So we've got a lot of mucus production because the mucus protects these guys, but there are parietal cells secreting hydrochloric acid. And don't worry about that. And then the chief cells secrete pepsinogen. And then pepsinogen, once it's exposed to the hydrochloric acid, becomes pepsin. And that is the first step in chemically digesting proteins. All right, so we have this highly acidic protein digesting fluid in the stomach, and it's lined by a bunch of cells that are made of proteins mostly. So we have to protect the epithelium from the gastric juice. And so to do that, we have what we call a mucosal barrier. So that's basically that mucus. It's actually alkaline mucus that's coating the stomach. Um, the epithelial cells also have tight junctions in between them to stop the acid from leaking into the underlying tissues. And then the other thing is that we just have really high turnover. So um, we have a lot of stem cells and we're completely replacing the lining of the stomach every three to six days because these cells just don't last that long in this very hostile environment. So that's how we don't digest ourselves is it takes a lot of work. Uh, it looks like this. So if you look, if you looked at it with a microscope from the surface, it just looks like a bunch of holes, but um, it's actually these deep little indentations that we call gastric glands where all the other cell types are located. And so the gastric juice then gets secreted out and um, mucus covers all of this stuff to keep it protected. All right, so the mechanical digestion basically sloshes everything back and forth. Um, and that's what forms chyme. So once, once we mix everything in the stomach, the contents of the lumen are called chyme. And then that pyloric sphincter at the end determines what actually makes it out of the stomach. So basically until it gets fully, the particles of food get broken down small enough, they stay in the stomach. And so the pylorus just stays really, really small and you have to be smaller than that to make it through. Uh, so we're basically just slowly emptying small amounts of chyme out of the pyloric sphincter into the small intestine. Uh, and so it can take um, hours to fully empty your stomach after a meal. Uh, the chemical digestion, as I said, is all about proteins. Uh, the hydrochloric acid also kills most bacteria, so there's an immune function there too, protecting us. And um, it also denatures the proteins, so it changes their form to make it easier for the enzyme to access them. Now, the other thing that's secreted in here is something called intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is necessary for vitamin B12 absorption in the small intestine. It's actually the only part of the stomach we can't live without. So if you lost your stomach for some reason, um, to injury or illness, you would need um, vitamin B12 injections because uh, that's the only part we can't actually live without. We, we need that B12 and we can't absorb it without intrinsic factor. I don't know why it works that way, it just does. All right, so before we actually get to the small intestine, we're gonna touch on these accessory organs because we need to understand their contributions first. So the abdominal accessory organs are the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. And they provide a lot of compounds that are necessary for the chemical digestion that occurs in the small intestine. So the liver makes bile, which we need for fat digestion. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, the gallbladder stores extra bile for the liver in between meals. And then the pancreas makes something called pancreatic juice, which is a combination of enzymes for breaking down food molecules and bicarbonate for neutralizing the hydrochloric acid that's coming from the stomach, because the stomach's the only one that can handle that, and the small intestine needs things to be not super acidic. Uh, as we'll talk about at the end, too, the liver also processes everything absorbed by the small intestine. So the liver has other roles 
but making bile is its contribution directly to digestion. So they're kind of located here. Your diaphragm sits above them, and this is your esophagus coming down. And so your liver is quite large, and then your gallbladder sits right below it, and then your pancreas sits here. And this is the your stomach would be. Oh, let me use a different color. So your stomach would be basically right here. And so your small intestine starts here and goes around like that. Um, they like to point out your spleen here, but I want you to be aware of the fact that your spleen is not part of the system, right? We, we already learned about it. It's part of the lymphatic system. So even though it's in the abdomen and the abdominal cavity, it is not part of the digestive system. All right, so the liver um, has both very simple and complex anatomy, but the part that I want you to be aware of is that it receives a double blood supply. So the hepatic artery delivers oxygenated systemic blood to the liver to supply it with oxygen. And then there's something called the hepatic portal vein that delivers all of the blood directly from the small intestine with everything that's been absorbed from your meal nutrients as well as potentially any toxins and so it processes all of those things that you've just absorbed before the rest of the body gets to see them which makes it super 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 important and and we'll touch on that a little bit more later and then um, there's also a, a duct carrying bile out and it comes out at the same point that those two vessels go in Uh, inside of the liver, there are sinusoids, so it's very leaky in there, and we basically just have these, these blood pools that bathe the cells of the liver, which are called hepatocytes, access to all the nutrients and toxins and waste coming from the intestine. So this allows the phagocytes to extract a lot of the toxins and detoxify them and process any waste, and then they'll also process the nutrients as well and kind of help um, control the supply for the rest of the body and store a lot of extra stuff. We also have phagocytic cells of the immune system here and they are filtering the blood very similarly to how the spleen does and so they will like remove old red blood cells and other things as well. So they, the liver also has um, spleen-like functions as, as well, although that's not its primary job. Uh, the bile itself is an alkaline solution, so that means it has a high pH, right, opposite of, of, of acidic. Um, and it contains a variety of things. So it has bile salts, bile pigments, cholesterol, triglycerides, phospholipids, and electrolytes. Um, bile pigments, the most common one is bilirubin, which is actually a product of it's, it's basically converted heme from hemoglobin breakdown from old red blood cells. And it's, it's how we get rid of that. And then the bile salts the liver makes from cholesterol, and they're the part that are actually really important for helping us digest lipids. So the gallbladder is just a storage system. It's literally just a little muscular sac. It stores the bile that the liver produces. It extracts a lot of the water out, so it concentrates it. And then it secretes it into the duodenum, which is the first portion of the small intestine. Um, it has like a body, a fundus, and a neck, so it's kind of just like, woo, like that. Um, and then it's got a little duct connected to the duct coming out of the liver. And then those guys go on to secrete into the duodenum. So it looks like that. So you can see coming out of the liver, coming out of the gallbladder, onto the small intestine. Um, the secreting or the, the concentrating can get a little crazy, so you can make gallbladder stones, and they can be quite painful when you then try to pass them out of that little duct. Um, so just wanted to show you some pictures of concentrated bile that has turned into stones. It's weird and, and slightly pretty at the same time. All right, third one is the pancreas. So um, remember that there's two parts to the pancreas, right? There's endocrine pancreas making insulin and glucagon, which we've touched on before. 
And then there's the exocrine pancreas, which makes pancreatic juice. Pancreatic juice is mostly a bunch of enzymes to digest all the nutrients. They're produced um, in, this is the majority of the pancreas, so basically acini are the little clusters of secretory cells, and then the ducts are the connection between that and the duodenum. The ducts are the ones that make the water and the bicarb, and the acini are the ones that make the enzyme in a form called zymogen. Um, so we basically make enzymes for all of the organic molecules that exist, and we make about a liter of this a day to digest our meals. So just a little breakdown of how that works there. Um, what you might ask is a zymogen. Well, a zymogen is an inactive pre-enzyme that needs to be activated before being functional. So the pepsinogen that gets secreted into the stomach is also a zymogen. And in, um, when we convert it into pepsin through exposure to hydrochloric acid, now we've activated that enzyme. So the pancreas does the same thing because it's making protein digesting enzymes too, and it doesn't want to be digested by its own products. So all of the protein digesting enzymes get secreted as these inactive precursors, and they don't get activated until they make it out into the small intestine to protect the pancreas from itself. All right, so there's the pancreas, this little guy here, and along with the bile, it's secreting right into this duodenum right here. So that's all the ducts. They actually come together before they secrete, so the bile and the pancreatic juice all get secreted at the same location. And the stomach is like literally right here, okay? We just can't show it because it would block everything. All right, so now we're actually ready to get into the small intestine. So small intestine is the longest part of the gastrointestinal tract. It's basically three meters long. It's like 10 feet, okay? Um, and it's longer after you're dead because then it's all relaxed. Before that, you have smooth muscle tone. Just a weird fact, it like doubles in length. But anyway, um, basically from the pyloric sphincter, which is where the stomach ends, to this guy called the ileocecal valve, which is where the large intestine begins. Um, and we divide it into three parts. So the very first part of it is the duodenum. It's less than 10 inches long, fairly short, uh, but it does receive everything from the stomach. So it's kind of a big deal. And then the rest of it is the jejunum and the ileum. So this is where almost all the digestion and almost all of the absorption occurs, which is one of the reasons why it's really long, because it takes time to do that. This is what it looks like. So the duodenum is the part that's retroperitoneal, and it's sitting there behind the membrane, uh, the peritoneal membrane, right along with the pancreas right there. And then it kind of comes out back into the abdominal cavity, and then all the swirly stuff like when I showed you the mesentery, that's all jejunum and, and ileum. It's hard to tell the difference between them. And then the ileum is the part that empties into the large intestine. Oh yeah, I did keep that. So this is the picture with the retroperitoneal. So duodenum and pancreas, you can see there's a kidney here too, and uh, parts of the colon as well. Uh, when we look at the details of this guy, it's a little bit different than the stomach. So the key here is increasing surface area for digestion and absorption. So we have three different features of the small intestine that do that. So the first one is circular folds, which are basically ridges of both the mucosa and the submucosa. And not only do they increase surface area, but they serve to actually spiral the intestinal contents through kind of helps move it through. When you increase your magnification, you get these villi, which are hair-like projections. And if you're just looking at the surface, it just makes it look fuzzy because they're quite small. Um, but if you increase your magnification, you see that they just kind of look like, like this. Um, the microvilli is the last one. So remember, microvilli are cellular extensions. Um, 
of, of the apical surface of epithelial cells. So these guys are columnar epithelial cells with these little microvilli on top. It's called the brush border here because it just kind of looks fuzzy. And so all of these things serve to greatly increase the actual surface area of the small intestine. It's called the small intestine because it's got a smaller diameter than the large intestine, by the way. Just point that out. Okay, so here's the whole thing. Here are these plica or circular folds and then um, if we look at the detail on that we see that what makes it all look fuzzy is these villi each of these little lines back here is meant to be a villi seen from a distance and then if you look at the villi then you see that um, sorry hold on I'm doing it wrong uh, sorry, this is the ridge of the plica, or the um, circular fold, and then each of these little guys is the villi, as well as all these little lines back here. So then if you, if you look at each villi, you see that it's got, of course, the epithelial cells all around it with the microvilli on them. Okay, so big, big surface area for digestion and absorption. It takes about three to six hours to digest and absorb all the nutrients from an average meal. Um, and most of the water that has either been consumed or secreted by that point is also absorbed. Uh, in order to support digestive processes, there's two basic patterns that we see in the small intestine. So segmentation is gonna be our mechanical digestion pattern to mix the chyme up with the bile, the pancreatic juice, and the intestinal juice. And then we actually have, um, we use regular peristalsis as well, but then we actually have this like super peristalsis. So when we wanna empty the small intestine in order to clear it out to have another meal, um, we use this migrating motor complex. And it just kind of moves everything from the very beginning of the small intestine all the way out. <clears throat> All right, in case you forgot what segmentation was, here's the picture again. Uh, chemical digestion is completed in the small intestine. Um, and the majority of it is actually carried out there as well. So uh, technically, we've started carbohydrate digestion from the amylase in your saliva. And then you've started the protein digestion from the pepsin in your stomach. Lipids are, are essentially untouched at this point. And we still have a long way to go on the carbs and the proteins too. So the first thing we're going to do is mix everything together. And that's going to neutralize the hydrochloric acid. And it's also going to give all of our enzymes access to these nutrients to start breaking down those chemical bonds. There's two stages of chemical digestion. Um, and that's because the pancreatic enzymes are able to break down these uh, polymers, these really long chains of organic molecules that are coming straight from the stomach. Once they've done that, we now have shorter molecules and the intestinal enzymes, which are actually attached to um, the epithelial cells, which are called enterocytes, um, are able to break them down into small enough components for absorption. So they basically have to be monomers or dimers. And what that means is something like monosaccharides, so like glucose, uh, individual amino acids, and we'll talk about lipids in a second. So with lipids, it's not as simple as just giving them enough enzymes to break them down into their, their key components. And that's because lipids are hydrophobic, so they don't have um, they're not dissolved in these solutions. And so the lipid enzymes, which are proteins and are dissolved in solution, have trouble accessing the lipids to actually break them down. And this is where bile comes in. So bile breaks apart the globules of fat that are still fairly large from our meals. This is a process called emulsification. Emulsification is when you take a big glob of, of lipids and you break it down into smaller globs. This is the same thing that soaps do. And this is why you need to use soap 
when you have grease on your clothes. So um, the, this is what the bile salts do. So the bile salts are kind of like phospholipids. They're amphipathic. They have a hydrophilic side and a hydrophobic side. So the hydrophilic side interacts with the hydrophobic lipids, and then the hydrophilic side happily interacts with the water. So now you have smaller droplets, and the enzymes can come in and break these guys down. Mostly what we have to do is just break the triglycerides down into individual fatty acids and monoglycerides. So one of the fatty acids stays connected to the glyceride part. Uh, we take those bile salts and we actually package the, the triglycerides and all of the other lipids into these little balls called micelles. So any cholesterol in your meal, um, any phospholipids from like membranes of cells, uh, the monoglycerides and the fatty acids, they all get shoved in here and then they can be absorbed along with everything else. So pretty much all of the digestible molecules in your food are going to be absorbed in your small intestine, as well as 80% of the electrolytes dissolved in this solution and 90% of the water. And keep me in mind that the, the water isn't just what you are consuming, it is also what is being secreted in. There's five different mechanisms of absorption and they all are the ways that we can move things across plasma membranes. So active transport using ATP, simple diffusion of really small nonpolar things, facilitated diffusion using channels, um, and stuff, uh, secondary active transport, moving things by creating a gradient with active transport, and then endocytosis, where the cell actually engulfs large amounts of stuff. Um, a lot of things are moved by co-transport or secondary active transport. And we do that by using sodium um, as our primary active transport. So what the intestinal cells do is they pump sodium out of the cells, keeping the sodium gradient inside the cell really low. Very little sodium inside the cell, which is totally normal, right? And so then we have a bunch of channels up here on the apical surface that allow sodium in, and it's gonna do that because it's moving down its gradient, which we maintain by pumping the sodium out down here. And then it's going to be a bunch of co-transporters that require another molecule to also let the sodium in. So uh, a lot of amino acids, glucose, galactose, other electrolytes, all of them are going to use these co-transports that move these guys into the enterocytes for absorption while we use ATP to pump out all the sodium to maintain the gradient. A lot of it happens like this. Lipids are, of course, different. So those micelles that we just formed um, are able to simply diffuse into the enterocytes because they are kind of the same thing as the plasma membranes. So that's cool. Um, and then the enterocytes actually process them um, <clears throat> and uh, turn them into a different ball of stuff that we'll talk about later. And then they get moved out and unlike everything else, so everything else gets moved out down here and goes into the blood. And the lipids actually end up in the lacteals, so the, the lymphatic capillaries. And we talked about this a little bit before. Um, this is uh, something you can actually see. So this is a picture of the mesentery. Uh, showing white lymphatic capillaries or lymphatic vessels. And you can see there's several of them here. They're moving here, they're going through a lymph node, and now we have a larger vessel emerging out, and away they go. So they're white because the lipid makes it white, which I think is kind of cool. All right, so with the absorption, um, it uh, and secretions, it happens in a variety of places. 
So between what we consume and what gets secreted to help us digest and absorb, we, we, we usually get about nine liters of water moving through the small intestine. And since we're absorbing most of it, we absorb eight liters and the large intestine is go gonna absorb the majority of the rest. So that by the time we get to the end of the large intestine, there's only about 100 milliliters of water in feces, just enough to keep it soft enough to move it out. Um, but if you look at this, you'll see that if we're consuming an average of two liters of fluid and food, um, everything else is getting secreted from our own store. So one to one and a half liters of saliva, one and a half liters of gastric secretions, a liter of bile, a liter of pancreatic juice, two liters of intestinal secretions. So um, it takes a lot of fluid to mix up all this stuff and, uh, and, and um, break it down for absorption is kind of your take home there. Uh, the water typically moves freely across the mucosa and this is mostly because, again, of those sodium pumps, um, it's gonna follow all of those solutes. So as we're absorbing everything else, the water follows. So when we get to the large intestine, its major function is to absorb that remaining water, and then whatever's left over gets eliminated as feces by defecation. Um, what is, getting moved into the large intestine from the small intestine is everything that was not digested or absorbed. Um, we're also absorbing salts, so electrolytes from this is um, too. And then there is one more thing that we're able to absorb here, and that's anything that the bacteria in your large intestine produce. So they are fermenting, they're, they're digesting stuff that we couldn't digest mostly fiber, um, and they're producing certain byproducts that we can actually absorb, and some of them are vitamins, very important. Um, the large intestine is called that because its diameter is larger than the small, but it's actually much shorter. There's four regions to the large intestine. So the cecum is the very beginning of it. It's a little sac, so the ileum empties here, and then we have this little sac of the cecum, the appendix sticks off the end of it. That's where your appendix is. And then, um, and then the rest of it is mostly colon. So the colon arches up and then over and then down. Um, <clears throat> so it goes ascending as it goes back up towards your head, transverse as it goes from right to left, and then descending as it goes back down. Um, ends with a sigmoid colon because it's got a little squiggle to it, and that's connected to the rectum which is the very last eight inches of large intestine. Um, it's got these little folds in it called rectal valves that kind of stick out, kind of like the circular folds. Um, they let you fart without pooping, you guys, so they're important. And then, of course, the very end is the anus, which is a canal, and then both an internal and external anal sphincter, which we'll talk about in a second. So, uh, cecum with appendix, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, uh, rectum, which rectum just means straight. Remember your rectus abdominis muscles? It just means straight. It runs straight out the bottom, okay? And then um, the very, very end of that is your anal canal and um, anal sphincters. There are some unique features to the large intestine too. Um, although theirs are more external, whereas with the stomach and the small intestine, it was more internal. So the longitudinal muscle of the large intestine is actually um, concentrated into three bands. They're called the tinea coli. And because of that, instead of being completely you know, like nor uniformly distributed, um, it actually forms, uh, it bunches up the large intestine into haustra. So haustra are pouches. Um, I'll show you another picture. It gives it a very unique um, texture. And then the other thing that we have are called epiploic appendages, which are extra little bits of visceral peritoneum um, that are attached to these teniae, tinea, tinea, 
um, I don't know why I can't remember that one, um, that are filled with fat. We don't know what they do. We don't know why they're there. We just know that they are. So that part's fun. Um, so the Haustra are just these little pouch-like things here, um, and they help with the, the, the mixing and the continued absorption of water. And then uh, the tinea are these bands. And you can't really see this guy, he's just showing a little bit of it because it's on the back. Okay, so that marks the difference between the colon versus the cecum here and the rectum here are these three features. Um, if we look at the surface of the mucosa, it's more like the stomach than the uh, small intestine. So we have crypts again, so holes and going down. Um, and everything in here is either goblet cells or just regular old enterocytes for absorbing water. We're not making enzymes, we're not digesting anything, we're just absorbing water and electrolytes, and we need to make a bunch of mucus because as we're drying out this, what is becoming feces, uh, we need it to be able to keep moving through. Um, the mucosa here is thicker because we have a lot of bacteria in here and we don't want them crossing over. Um, <clears throat> and then when we get to the anus, we finally transition from a columnar epithelium in back into stratified squamous epithelium, uh, which I didn't mention before, but this is what we have in our mouse, pharynx, and our esophagus as well. I guess I should have said that. Um, and there's some features of the anus that you don't really need to worry about. Um, yeah, I don't want to worry about that. Uh, so it kind of looks like this, again, very similar to the stomach. So we have these crypts that are the openings and then the glands, so these deep indentations, and mostly we're just putting mucus out onto the surface. I mentioned it, so we have a lot of microorganisms in the large intestine, uh, mostly bacteria, but other things as well. And we collectively call them the microflora or the microbiome. Um, they're supposed to be there. Uh, they have important functions. So they do ferment fiber um, and anything else that's indigestible to us, to be honest. They have access to whatever they want of anything that goes into the large intestine, but mostly it's fiber. Um, they make these things called BFAs that are actually good for your large intestinal mucosa, good for their health. This is one of the reasons why fiber is important in your diet. Uh, they do make gases as a byproduct. So that is one of the major sources of flatulence or gas that gets passed out the anus. Um, and they make a lot of uh, B vitamins and vitamin K. It's actually one of our most important sources of vitamin K is from the bacteria in our large intestine rather than from our diet. Um, this is something that is still being studied and we don't know a ton about it but we know it's really, really important. And the more we learn, um, the more important it seems to get. And we're slowly learning how to like interact with it and potentially influence it. But we really don't know what we're doing yet. So don't really buy into anything that's being sold as a probiotic now, to be honest, because we don't really know, just saying. Uh, I don't have time to talk about the details about that. Okay. so. The physiology in a nutshell is absorbing stuff. So uh, it takes about 12 to 24 hours to fully absorb that last 0.8 liters of water and vitamins and electrolytes. Again, a lot of what's going on here is that sodium pumping and everything else is following. The other function of the large intestine is moving the feces through to the rectum and anus and eliminating it with defecation. So the motility types that we have here, we have these hostral contractions, which is what we call the segmentations that keep mixing the contents to make sure we absorb all the water. And then they also have mass movements similar to what the large intestine does, where we have these peristaltic waves that go from one end of the colon to the other and force everything into the rectum. And what tends to trigger this is something called the gastrocolic reflex. 
If any of you have small children or animals, you know that when you eat, you often poop within 20 to 30 minutes after. That's because filling the stomach triggers this movement towards pooping. It's basically like, hey, we got new stuff in there. Let's get rid of the old stuff. As we get older, that's not always consistent for a variety of reasons, um, but typically when you're young um, and often with animals, uh, that maintains its consistency. So then the last thing that we do is defecation. And this is also a reflex, very similar to swallowing. Uh, this is again, something that only one part does, right? We only have one entryway, we only have one exit. So this is only performed by the anus. Um, feces is just everything that we couldn't digest and absorb in the intestines. So any undigested food, again, mostly that's fiber. Uh, anything that wasn't absorbed, a remarkably large amount of bacteria that uh, accidentally hitched a ride out. Um, epithelial cells from the end of the small intestine and throughout the whole large intestine that get shed, uh, like exfoliating your skin. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of mucus. And then the remaining water and salts. So like swallowing, defecation is a combination of involuntary reflexes and voluntary actions. But unlike swallowing, where we start with the voluntary actions and then we go to involuntary, in defecation, it's kind of the opposite. So with defecation, we're starting with this involuntary mass movement, so peristalsis, forcing feces into the rectum. We stretch the rectum, which triggers an autonomic reflex, so the parasympathetic nervous system is in charge of this. And it's actually a spinal reflex in your sacral spinal segments, but you also are informing your brain. So your brain gets informed that this is happening and you have two choices. Uh, you can either say, yep, it's a good time and relax the external anal sphincter because that's skeletal muscle. So that's the part you have under conscious control. Your internal anal sphincter is smooth muscle and it already relaxed. Um, and then, um, if you say no, now's not a good time, you can keep your external anal sphincter constricted and eventually, um, all that smooth muscle of the anus, except for the sphincter, the sphincter tightens back up again, um, will relax. And so then if you don't defecate at the moment, the urge to go will die back. Um, and then at some point the process happens again and it'll happen again. Um, if you do relax your external anal sphincter, you can aid the process with additional skeletal muscle effort, mostly through your abdominal muscles. And some people say that this is a, a good position for pooping. Um, because sitting on a toilet as we do in Western cultures is actually kind of weird based on everything. Anyway, um, so this is an overview by location, um, makes for a great study start. So you start here and then you flesh it out from there. Um, so lots of nice diagrams in this particular chapter. Now you'd think we'd be done but we're not. Um, and that's because we also have to deal with what happens after we absorb this stuff. So we're gonna very briefly talk about metabolism. Um, I'm just gonna get you started. We're gonna finish it on Wednesday before we start the urinary system, okay? All right, so metabolism. What we wanna know is what hormones control this stuff? So remember that metabolism is all the biochemical reactions occurring in the body and that we can divide it all up into two categories. So catabolism is anytime we break down molecules and release energy and hopefully capture some of it in the form of ATP. And anabolism is anything that builds complex molecules out of smaller ones and it typically involves the input of energy. So we're actually storing energy in chemical bonds. You may or may not remember these from the beginning of the class. 
I always remember anabolism by thinking about anabolic steroids um, and like weightlifters using that. And um, there really isn't any diagrams for catabolism. So I give you a cat pushing water bottles off of a shelf. All right, so there are hormones that regulate both of these processes. And so we can actually put them into categories. Are they catabolic hormones or are they anabolic hormones? Catabolic hormones are all the ones that stimulate catabolism. So stimulate the breakdown of complex molecules into smaller ones and therefore the production of energy. Uh, cortisol, glucagon, and epinephrine are our major catabolic hormones. So cortisol is released in response to stress, remember, from the adrenal gland. And it stimulates gluconeogenesis, which is the production of new glucose, usually by the liver, for release into the blood. Um, and that's because the idea is when you're stressed, you need extra fuel. Glucagon is released in response to low blood sugar. Hopefully you remember that too. And again, that's released from the pancreas, and that acts on the liver to both break down glycogen and make new glucose so that we're increasing blood glucose levels. Epinephrine released by the sympathetic nervous system. So this is also stress response stuff here um, from the adrenal medulla is also going to stimulate gluconeogenesis as well as a bunch of other things which are why it stimulates gluconeogenesis. So again, we're raising blood glucose with the idea that we are gonna need more glucose available for, for fuel because we're increasing our heart rate, increasing how hard it's pumping, increasing blood pressure, opening airways to bring in more oxygen, all of that stuff. So mostly we're gonna be worrying about glucagon. Anabolic hormones are ones that uh, stimulate the uh, synthesis of complex molecules from simpler ones and use energy. So we're capturing energy in, in um, chemical bonds. And uh, we'll go through each of these and what they do. So remember that growth hormone is released from the pituitary gland. Um, growth hormone is kind of weird. So it does stimulate, of course, the growth of cells and tissues and bones, right? Although we know that it mostly does it indirectly. Um, directly, it actually stimulates gluconeogenesis in the liver, which kind of makes it sound catabolic, but it's doing it so that your tissues have energy to grow. So it's kind of weird like that. Um, and of course, it activates insulin-like growth factor, which um, stimulates the growth of a lot of tissues, including muscle and bone. The major player here, though, is of course insulin. It's released from the pancreas. Um, in response to high blood glucose levels. And basically it makes tissues take more glucose in. Um, it also makes the muscles and the liver store glucose as glycogen and um, convert, converts glucose into fat in the adipose tissue. Um, testosterone and estrogen are of course also anabolic. Um, testosterone especially has growth promoting effects on bone density and muscle mass and strength. Um, estrogen typically increases metabolic rate and increases fat deposition. So it's more about energy storage. Although it is good for bone density. Your book didn't talk about it. All right, so what are we doing to make all of this energy? Well, we're doing a bunch of reactions called cellular respiration. So cellular respiration uses um, the fuels from food to regenerate ATP. And the process of regenerating ATP is called phosphorylation, adding a high energy phosphate group to a molecule. So basically what happens is when we use ATP, it becomes a DP. And then when we do the phosphorylation process, we add another phosphate on again. Because T stands for tri and D stands for di. So we're going from a triphosphate to a diphosphate and we can regenerate it by adding a phosphate on again. And then we can use that ATP to do more stuff. All right, 
So there's two basic ways of making more ATP out of AT out of ADP. One of them is called substrate level phosphorylation, and that's where we can directly transfer a phosphate group from a phosphorylated substance. So literally you're just taking a phosphate from one place and putting it onto the ATP, making an ATP. Um, this is relatively inefficient, but it does the job when we need it. The efficient way to do it is called oxidative phosphorylation. And with oxidative phosphorylation, we create a gradient of hydrogen ions across a membrane, and then we use that concentration gradient to power an enzyme called ATP synthase to phosphorylate ADPs. Um, this one does not require mitochondria. The substrate level, the oxidative does. So oxidative phosphorylation requires mitochondria and oxygen. So we typically do this one if we don't have one or the other requirements for this one. This one is highly efficient and gives us a lot more ATP, but it has stricter requirements. All right, so uh, on Wednesday, we'll start by briefly talking about the rest of this metabolism stuff, and then we will talk about, um, we'll start talking about the urinary system. So I will see you all on Wednesday. Stop. Stop.